Hello and welcome to NSAIDs and Atrial Fibrillation. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. This video is part of our two-minute EBP challenge. Every week we send out a challenge question on Friday and then on Monday you get the response to the question. This is based on evidence-based practice to help you to stay up to date in what's happening in nursing. If you'd like to get your free copy, you can subscribe at edfornurses.com and every Friday in your email you will get a copy of our question. Every Monday you'll get the response, the answer. Now, as the name implies, this has to be something you can do in two minutes. So you have to be able to read it pretty quickly, etc., so you can stay up to date rather quickly. So it's my job in order to make that short and condensed and to the point so that you will be able to get the information you need as quickly as possible. Subscribe again at edfornurses.com. Well, this week's question was about non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are a group of medications that are designed to try to treat pain and inflammation. As the name implies, non-steroidal. Okay, well, steroids also treat inflammation and pain, but steroids have lots and lots of side effects. So they came out with this grouping of medications that they called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory medications. These medications typically work on two different areas in the inflammatory process, and that's going to be COX-1 and COX-2. Cyclooxygenase 1 and cyclooxygenase 2 are the different receptor sites they work on. Most of the drugs that we think of as being NSAIDs or non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are medications that work a little bit on both 1 and 2. So they're kind of combination drugs on 1 and 2. Let's talk a little bit about the drugs themselves. So what are NSAIDs? Well, here is a list of some common NSAIDs that we would be using in our patients. Ibuprofen, very common one that we're using in our patients, right? We see that a lot. It's out there all over the place. You go to the grocery store, it's all over the place. And a lot of times this is going to be sold as being a non-aspirin pain reliever. So understand that many of your patients may not understand what this drug is all about. And you may have to really kind of run down the list with them to try and figure out if they're taking any of these. You know, you may tell the patient or ask the patient, hey, do you get Advil or Motrin or anything like that? And no, no, I don't take anything like that. Well, and then they tell you, well, I've been taking ibuprofen. They don't know it's the same drug. Most patients don't know about generic and trade names and things like that. They don't know all about all that stuff. So we're going to have to kind of run down through the list here to be able to find the drugs that the patient is taking. So this is just an example list of different non anti-inflammatories that your patient might be on. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories are primarily used to treat mild to moderate pain. So you sprain an ankle or something like that, that would be a good situation for a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory. Commonly used for treating arthritis. So you'll often see your patients with arthritis being treated with NSAIDs. And typically we're going to do the replacements, the knee replacement, hip replacement, etc. after the NSAIDs are no longer being effective. Acute gout, dysmenorrhea, very commonly used for dysmenorrhea, headache, and migraine, one of the most common medications used for headache is going to be non anti-inflammatories. In fact, very effective in many patients with migraine in treating their pain. So non anti-inflammatories are a very commonly used medication to treat pain, very commonly used as a good adjunct to even using narcotics, etc., for patients with chronic pain. Let's look at the bottom one, though. The bottom one says fever. It's also an antipyretic, just like acetaminophen is an antipyretic and helps to bring down fever, so does the NSAIDs. And in fact, NSAIDs, specifically ibuprofen, has been shown to reduce fever faster and keep the fever down longer in children than does acetaminophen. So this may be something you want to take into consideration too the next time you have a fever. You might want to use the NSAID instead of the Tylenol or the acetaminophen. However, there are side effects. Oh, it sounded too good to be true, didn't it? Well, yes, it is. In fact, there are side effects of using NSAIDs. And most of the time, you're not going to experience any of these if you're using it in moderation and you're using it only occasionally. If you're using your NSAIDs on a regular basis, then you may have some more problems with side effects. One of the most common side effects that we've all heard about is going to be the gastrointestinal side effects, GI bleeding, bleeding anywhere in the GI tract. So people who have diverticulitis, inflammatory bowel disease, 
disease, etc., should not be taking NSAIDs because this can cause bleeding in the GI tract. A number of reasons why that happens with NSAIDs. NSAIDs tend to increase the amount of stomach acid the patient produces, and they also tend to make the stomach lining more susceptible to having erosion. Renal effects of NSAIDs. There's a number of renal effects, and NSAIDs are generally considered to be nephrotoxic, especially in high doses or for a long period of times. Photosensitivity could also be an issue. Usually this is for patients who are taking NSAIDs in a short duration or for a short period of time. Lastly is the cardiovascular effects. These are the ones that we are going to be talking about here. We're going to be talking a little bit about the cardiovascular effects because again our topic is NSAIDs and atrial fibrillation. So let's take a look at those. It has been widely talked about that NSAIDs have a number of cardiovascular effects, including an increased risk of myocardial infarction and stroke, an increased risk of death if the patient is having an MI and takes an NSAID, an increased risk of recurrent myocardial infarction, and double the risk for heart failure in patients who are taking NSAIDs versus patients who are not. Now when you look at some of these things, one question that comes to my mind is, well wait a minute, don't we prescribe aspirin to patients who have an myocardial infarction? Well, okay, well if they're having an MI and we give them an aspirin, aspirin's an NSAID. Well aspirin, especially in the low dose that we're using, is going to have not the same kind of effect as these other NSAIDs we're talking about here. So in other words, we're not going to get the same kind of adverse cardiac effects with our low-dose aspirin as we get with the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. In fact, if our patient takes an NSAID, such as ibuprofen, for example, during an MI, it tends to negate some of the beneficial effects we get from the aspirin. Okay, so let's stay away from those NSAIDs in our patients who are having MIs and patients who are at risk for MI and stroke. Well, what about the renal effects, and how does a patient end up developing atrial fibrillation? We think it's the renal effects of the drug that cause patients to develop atrial fibrillation and atrial flutter as new onset dysrhythmias when they're taking the medications. The renal effects include fluid retention, electrolyte disorders, and alterations in blood pressure. Because non-steroidal anti-inflammatories have an effect on the kidneys, and there's a couple different effects they have. One is they decrease the perfusion through the kidneys, which is going to make fluid retention possible. The kidneys think that you're not volume, you don't have enough volume on board, so they start to retain more volume. The electrolyte disorders, uh, there's a number of electrolyte disorders that can happen as a result of having both the decreased perfusion to the kidney and having an increase in blood pressure. So as the renal perfusion decreases, then the kidneys are going to stimulate an increase in blood pressure, and blood pressure alterations can cause effects both on the heart and on the kidneys themselves. Now, atrial fibrillation is a dysrhythmia that occurs in the patient's heart because we're having abnormal ectopic beats that are occurring somewhere outside of the normal conduction pathway. So here's the normal conduction pathway. We have the sinus node up there at the top left and it is generating an impulse, sending that impulse through the atria and down to the atrioventricular node, the AV node. The AV node delays the impulse for a split second, then sends it down through the bundle and down to the Purkinje fibers where it spreads out to the ventricles. So that's our normal conduction pathway. Now what happens in atrial fibrillation is that our patient is going to have multiple ectopic foci, so a whole bunch of little ectopics that are just shooting off all over the atria, and they are generating all of these little waves. They're generating just like a whole bunch of little P waves. Now, we don't call them P waves when it's atrial fibrillation or atrial flutter. We call them F waves. It's either capital F or a small F wave, depending on if it's fib or flutter. But these are little waves that are generated by all these little ectopic beats, all these little ectopic discharges that are occurring in the atria. So it's not coming from the sinus node. It's coming from elsewhere. In fact, these discharges can go at a rate of 350 beats per minute. Thank goodness all of them don't hit the ventricle. So what happens is the AV node kind of filters out some of these electrical impulses that are coming to it, and not all of them hit the ventricle. Unfortunately, they hit the ventricle in a way that is not real consistent. So most of the time, the AV node does not allow just some of them to go down through, like every third one. Instead, it's just kind of allowing random impulses to go down to the ventricle. So that means that the patient can end up with a very irregular ventricular response in atrial fibrillation. Atrial flutter is a little bit different. Atrial flutter 
there does seem to be a consistency. So there seems to be like three waves that come through and then a ventricular beat. Three waves that come through then a ventricular beat. But that does not occur with atrial fibrillation. In atrial fibrillation, we get what are called little F waves. Now you see all that inconsistency in the baseline of your ECG here. And what's happening is all this little inconsistency, all that kind of waviness in the baseline is a result of the patient having all of these little discharges that are occurring up in the atria, all these little random chaotic electrical activities that are occurring in the atria. The characteristics that are really help you to pick this out and say, hey, that's atrial fibrillation are, number one, it is irregularly irregular. That is the main characteristic that we're going to see that tells us this is atrial fibrillation. It's irregularly irregular. So you're feeling somebody's pulse and you feel this irregular pulse. One thing you want to ask yourself is, is there a pattern to that irregularity? Is it like beat, 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 pause, beat, 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 pause? In this case, in atrial fibrillation, there is no pattern. It is irregularly irregular. So that is a main key here that's going to cue us in that this could be atrial fib. So how are we going to use this information in our practice? First of all, with patient teaching. You want to teach your patient about the risks of using NSAIDs, especially as patients get older. The risk of developing atrial fibrillation increases with age. It also increases with arthritis and it also increases with renal dysfunction. So those are going to be patient situations where we really want to be careful that our patient is getting good teaching about watching the NSAID use and then especially reporting any signs that they may have. Certainly if they have syncope, if they have palpitations, if they have dizziness or lightheadedness when they're getting up, those are all signs that they have decreased cardiac output possibly related to having atrial fibrillation. So we want to teach the patient those signs and symptoms and let them know they need to get in and see their doctor if any of those things occur. On our own assessment, we want to be looking for the irregular heartbeats or the abnormal heartbeats, changes in the patient's hemodynamics and the patient's blood pressure specifically. And then monitoring we're going to monitor our vital signs as usual, but in addition, we may also have to put this patient on telemetry so that we can monitor the patient's heart rate and make sure that the patient is not flipping in and out of atrial fibrillation. The main concern with atrial fibrillation is that the patient can develop blood clots in the atria as a result of the atria not contracting fully like they're supposed to. This can lead to a blood clot being thrown and going to the brain, so very, very important that we are watching patients who have atrial fibrillation and making sure they're adequately anticoagulated. Thank you for joining me for NSAIDs and atrial fibrillation. I hope you will join us on the two-minute EBP challenge. Go to edfornurses.com to sign up. Thanks again for joining me. My name is David Woodruff, and until next time, bye now. <laughs>